This uh, next figure is uh, probably familiar to everybody here, I imagine. He uh, is going to have to be the most prolific uh, psychedelic researcher ever to have come out of Denmark. And uh, he's also the first of only two Danish speakers on the program today. Uh, it is uh, David Eitri. Uh, he's a clinical psychiatrist uh, at the Maudsley Hospital in London and a postdoc brain imaging researcher at Imperial College. He holds a PhD from Copenhagen University and he was originally trained in imaging research at Columbia University in New York City. Give a very warm welcome to David Eitri. Tak. Tusind tak. Um, Oh yeah, in English actually. Um, thank you, <laughs> uh, and thanks to uh, a lot actually to psychedelic uh, society people who have organized uh, this really really nice event, and that ha they have uh, opened the opportunity for me to uh, drag along uh, the dream team of uh, colleagues from Imperial, which is an en enormous pleasure to have. Everybody who you have been hearing today uh, coming to, to, to Copenhagen and to, to show more in depth uh, what is going on in the lab that we work in um, in London uh, and then also for them to experience and see Copenhagen in, uh, is also a great thing. Um, so we are very um, happy about that. So thanks a lot. Um, so uh, this obviously also means that when I when I sort of arranged this with Casper, I forgot to say that probably I didn't want to speak myself because now everybody who is like actually knows in detail about all the data they are here. So then, I, what should I actually then be speaking about? But I will be talking about um, the personality um, issue, which is something that I'm very interested in, but. It's very psychological, and I'm a psychiatrist, but still, so it's a little bit out of my comfort zone in a way because it's not very related to to imaging uh, as such. That's where I have my my training. But um, anyway, um, let's uh, go go through it at least as a teaser uh, of um, what might come out of some of this. This is uh, basically the same as Robin showed, but he had removed all the the lines because it looks um, a little bit confusing. It's simpler just with a black. Uh, Uh, once, um, but I'm just going to repeat uh, for you in order to uh, open um, the talk. So Robin basically showed the same figure with the black ones sitting here. With the, they are the averages, and this is from the depression trial with psilocybin that you have heard a lot about today in the different talks. Um, and and here you can see some people uh, are staying down, which is of course a great thing, that means that they are sort of cured over a long period at least, um, and some go back up, and that's also what you expect, that it, it, it can't be a magic bullet that just does it for everybody for, 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 for many, many months. Um, however, the average is actually staying nicely uh, down uh, from what you might expect from a one-off session. This is one intervention, and the results are quite uh, nicely sustained, and that's what I'm going to uh, focus on. Um, so this is um, together with uh, Christopher O. Mott Andersen, who's here somewhere, uh, who's graduating as a psychologist from Copenhagen University. We are um, doing a review at the moment and we are taking all the, the modern studies, uh, not, not that many, but the ones since uh, um, over the last 10, 15 years that have come out that have a clinical clinical studies. So looking at depression, anxiety, um, in a clinical population, or it could be smoking, um, drinking, OCD, and so on. And then we have taken out the, the ones that report anxiety symptoms, depression symptoms, and this is just to show you something quite interesting, and that is that across all these studies, it really does look like it's not, it's just, it's not just a, a day, a week, a couple of weeks, but... Um, For as long as they have been uh, recording clinical outcome measures in these studies, they seem to stay down. So this is an interesting phenomenon. This is why we are so excited and why we are talking about a potential paradigm shift that you have this one um, um, powerful intervention um, that creates a change in people. And therefore, it's also worth exploring what what is that change. One thing is that the clinical symptoms, they go down, but since they are sustained 
is there something even sort of more deep change going on that we could maybe pick up by assessing people's uh, personality? Before going to that, I'll show you, um, um, this is the ketamine. So you're going to hear more about ketamine, and I hope not to provoke the presenter talking about ketamine. Uh, but overall, um, this is one of the early studies with ketamine. Ketamine is uh, in, incredibly exciting in psychiatry. It's it's the, the new thing. It's not that new, but 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 using it infusions of ketamine to treat treatment resistant depression is very exciting. Good results. But as you see here, one of the early studies, uh, modern studies of ketamine infusion for you see here that um, the results with the ketamine, the white ones, uh, go down, but they go back up quite quickly. So this is already within a week. And doing meta-analysis, taking all the clinical studies with a one infusion of ketamine, the effect seems to last 10, 12 days. So what you just saw on the psilocybin data, it looks different. However, it's, it's a bit too early to be overexcited because the quality, I mean, it's not to, to ditch our own research, but you, you, it needs to be it needs to be done even more stringent, larger sizes, and it needs to be a better attempted uh, placebo control some of these trials. So, so we are working towards that, but it looks promising. And this was one of the early trials, and the, these are the early trials with Alzheimer's. So there's something sustained going on. Um, and could it be that personality, we could pick it up there, that, that the personality is actually affected? So first of all, what is personality? Uh, it's... Um, uh, characteristics or blend of characteristics that make a person unique um, and it's related to the patterns of thinking, feeling and behaving. Um, and, and that means it's personality is a trait measure and not a state measure. So trait means it's sort of long-standing things that are part of who we are. It's not just a, a, a quick sudden change in our emotional state, that, that's a state measure. That's typical clinical outcome measure, typical state measures. How are you feeling at the moment? That, that's, a, that's about state. But if, if you're feeling the same for a very, very long time, then it, it would be picked up as a trait um, when you assess that. And of course, it's a little bit arbitrary to, to distinguish completely between trait and state, but it's, it's terms often used in psychology and psychiatry. Um, <clears throat> and then the big question, if, if because we are speaking about single intervention, these clinical studies that I showed before, including our depression trial, is it even possible to think that personality on a th theoretical level that we can affect personality with a one-off intervention? Um, so that's the first question to, to, to sort of um, try to answer. And before doing that, I need to present you with how do we actually assess um, Personality and and one of the most used tool in psychology um, to to uh, to get a, a good description of somebody's personality is a, is the uh, neo uh, peer um, which is uh, it covers five uh, personality traits. It's a big questionnaire. People self rated on a five point Likert scale, so the five things that they can rate for each item, and there are 240 items, so it takes like uh, 45 minutes or something like that, so it's quite a long, tedious uh, uh, questionnaire to fill out. Um, and, and it then ends up being scored um, into to these uh, five domains or five traits, five personality traits, neuroticism, extroversion, openness, agreeableness, consciousness, uh, consensusness. Um, Mental mentioned openness to experience already, but this is going to uh, be um, more in depth about um, openness to experience um, in particular, which is a trait we're very interested in. Um, just for you to know that emotional stability on some measures of personality, it's actually not referred to a, a neuroticism, it's emotional stability. It's kind of the opposite of neuroticism, so it, it fills out the same same domain or same trait. So emotional is just the, the positive measure of neuroticism. So the higher neuroticism, the lower emotional stability. But some of the measures, uh, some of the uh, questionnaires uh, use the term emotional stability and, and other uh, neuroticism. Neopia uses neuroticism. That's why there's an N there. Okay. Um, one thing... Um, uh, also important to mention is that we know that depression is 
uh, in, in people with depression, neuroticism is high. Neuroticism is a trait again, but it's basically a vulnerability trait for developing affective disorders such as depression and, and anxiety. So it's not very surprising that they will score higher on neuroticism than controls. Um, but there has also been shown that uh, in some studies of uh, depression that people are lower in openness and extroversion, at least in, 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 in some studies. Um, then I'm going to go step a bit uh, to one side in order to get my beloved um, receptors and imaging into to the equation. Also because we haven't, today we've heard about brain imaging and we've heard about 2A receptors, but I'm just going to emphasize that we haven't actually talked about the imaging technique that can actually measure the 2A receptors. Somebody also asked about how the different um, drugs differed with relation to the 2A. I just want to, to emphasize that the, the, all the stuff that Leah and, and, and Robin was showing in terms of me, it's MRI, so it's, it's, it's brain activity. And, 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 um, but if we actually want to measure on the receptors directly, we need to use another technique called PET imaging or SPECT imaging, but PET imaging is the most advanced. And um, so by, by using that technique, it's, a, it's radioactive, more invasive kind of imaging technique, we can measure receptors in the brain. We can measure also release of um, the brain's own transmitter substances um, in, in some designs with PET imaging. And if we measure the 2A receptor, the 2A receptor, a lot of people in here have heard about, you also heard about today, that is the main receptor that psychedelics, they stimulate, they, they are agonists, they are stimu stimulators of the 2A receptor. And if we measure that receptor with PET imaging, this is an average image of 140 um, healthy people done here in Copenhagen. Um, with, with PET imaging of the 2A receptor, and you can see there's a lot of them where there's very warm colors in the posterior cingular, an interesting region um, talked about by Robin. Um, and um, if we look at that receptor that we stimulate with psychedelics, this is just healthy, nothing to do with psychedelics, just the same receptor, it's actually correlated with trait neuroticism in independent samples done here in Copenhagen by a neurofarm center, uh, a SIMPI um, at Rishusbetaler. Um, so the more 2A receptors we can measure in the brain, the more um, it, it's correlated to, to neuroticism. Um, and, and it also is uh, same direction correlated to pessimism in depression. So the more 2A receptor, uh, receptors we can measure, the, the more pessimism in depression. And the theory is that these systems in depression and anxiety, that the serotonergic transmission, the ability to sort of um, communicate using serotonin in the brain in a healthy way is impaired a bit in depression. And as a compensatory mechanism, that's at least what we believe, 2A receptors might be upregulated. So that might be why uh, they are high. And that is also part of the reason why a 2A agonist the psychedelics, they're all two agonists, they simulate the action of serotonin in the self by stimulating the receptor, um, maybe because they're understimulated. That might, that's the sort of very pharmacological receptor version of the story of why we believe it might uh, work. But here you see an interesting relationship by something that's relevant for the psychedelic mode of action and is also uh, relevant to um, personality uh, research. Um, and this is just as a teaser, nothing to do with the talk uh, otherwise, but in the future we might have a tool to actually measure serotonin release. We are publishing that uh, very soon, that we are able now to measure release in the brain of serotonin and all that line of work can potentially also be applied to depression research and, and, and with, with psychedelics. Um, and we are taking this method into depression in order to, to measure, um, uh, to try to see if the hypothesis about low uh, transmission of serotonin in depression is true or not. Um, so the question was, can personalities, uh, personality traits change? And the, what I asked specifically about, could one event change it? But first, can they change at all? And the, 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 um, even though the people say they are quite stable, they are quite stable, but they do slowly, gradually change. 
Um, so the, for instance, uh, over time, as an average, as a population at least, people become uh, more for, uh, confident, agreeable, conscientious and emotionally stable uh, with age. And it's typically described as a slow, gradual thing that, 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 you know, that happens over time. It's, it's very little per decade that, that these measures change. However, something that's a bit interesting is, are we sure that this is actually slow and gradual? How do we know? And um, we don't, basically, because that is not something that has been really studied very much. When people talk about long, do longitudinal designs to measure this, basically they, they sample like that. They sample at a one time point and then long time after, and then they conclude that there is this change over this and that per decade. Uh, and then they just assume that it has happened with equal change per time point in the interim period. But how do we know? If you measured people's personality every week and then big things happen sometimes in their lives and for months nothing much happened, maybe it's very stable for those months and then maybe this peak in important experiences that actually does change them in more like this. <clears throat> and by, by as, uh, assessing personality like this, we, we, we don't know. Um, so basically, the, so, so, so this is the alternative hypothesis that maybe events could be what is driving personality more abruptly in, in steps. So in order for us to, to at least get closer, is this even possible? We would need to find some evidence that interventions or events can actually push personality in a short period of time. And a big recent review on 207 studies looking at personality measures uh, in relation to intervention for mental health um, clinical uh, treatments, uh, mainly depression and anxiety, um, this was looked at. Yeah, So this was uh, to, to all uh, 200, more than 200 studies of uh, clinical intervention studies where personality had been assessed before and after. It was, uh, most of these studies, was, it was not, the ma mo main focus was not personality. The main focus was, hey, we treat these people for their depression with whatever uh, pharmaceutical, and then they, we also throw in a personality questionnaire as well. A little bit as we are doing as well. It's not, it's not the primary thing to look at because obviously it's more important whether people get cured for the depression. Uh, but it's often at, as an additional thing put in, more and more actually. Um, so that means that suddenly there's a lot of data to look at. And, and this guy looked at it, and this is a confusing uh, uh, figure to look at, but if you start by looking at the orange uh, part here, then these are the five personality traits that I mentioned before. And the one that is really, really changing, that, that's clear that there is a, definitely a change from intervention, from treatment um, across all these studies is emotional stability, which is the same as neuroticism, yeah? Um, so, as, and, and that's also the, the trait that I showed is related to, it's a vulnerability factor for depression and anxiety, and it, it has that relation with two-way receptor levels as well. Um, but that is definitely possible to change that with intervention. The others as well, the ones that is less easy to change with cl clinical intervention is the op openness. And then. This is over time, and this basically shows that it seems to be long-lasting. It's not just uh, short, because when you both look at it, how immediately changed, but also after six months, 12 months, it still stays relatively high and unchanged. Um, so, the, so it seems to be possible to quickly change personality measures and have it sustained even after you stop the intervention. Um, and then the, there's different things. Hospital, going to hospital doesn't change people's personality, apparently. Um, I don't know why it should, but anyway, it doesn't. Um, and the other uh, uh, therapies, all a bit similar in, in the uh, ability to do it. In terms of the different conditions, anxiety and personality, disorders, it's also a little bit confounded, I would say this, so don't put too much into that with the personality uh, disorders, the people change personality when you treat the personality disorders, because there you are more focusing on, on, on these specific items that would be affected by rating personality. But anyway, depression is changed, anxiety even more. It's possible to change uh, through intervention when, 
their, their personality uh, for, for these conditions. Okay, so now I'm um, going to speak a little bit about um, uh, um, openness. Openness is, is the, the trait that has received quite a lot of attention specifically for the field of psychedelic research. It's related to aesthetic appreciation, sensitivity, imagination, fantasy, also creativity has even been related to intelligence as well and broad-minded tolerance of other people's viewpoints and values. Um, and, and one of the very important uh, uh, studies that sort of was part of, of reopening the whole field of psychedelics, I would say, uh, and, and, and also giving extra weight behind taking it into clinical research, was uh, the Johns Hopkins study, Catherine McLean, um, that showed that uh, a, a one-off psilocybin session to people who were naive to psychedelics, that they changed in, in openness score, one of these traits. Um, and the more mystical, and this is relating back to what Robin was also saying and Leo was talking about, that the actual quality, the depth of the psychedelic experience it was related to the later outcome. So the more mystical, or the people who had a proper mystical or peak experience, they were the ones that were still changed more than a year after this uh, one-off psychedelic experience that they had. Um, and we have also seen in, 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 in the Imperial group, in the LSD trial, that when um, um, personality was assessed two weeks after the uh, intervention with LSD and healthy, um, um, openness was also increased there. And then we also seen in other studies in ayahuasca users, uh, and this is different because this is not intervention, this is not experimental studies, these ones are cross-sectional. So there you just go in and look at personality in a group of people who have had psychedelics versus a group who hasn't. That's cross-sectional. It's not the same as doing it pre and post in the same people. It's always stronger to do it pre and post in the same people. But uh, ceremonial use of ayahuasca versus non-users, they were higher in openness. They were also high in agreeableness, actually. And um, then there's a study, there are some studies uh, about um, creativity. This is a self-rate of something related to uh, uh, creativity. And as I said, creativity is correlated with openness. So it's another indication that maybe psychedelics has a relationship with openness. And then also in, in a sample from Copenhagen, um, we have also seen higher openness in psychedelic users. And this is from this sample. Um, Psychedelic users, MDMA users, non-drug users, the psychedelic users score higher on openness in this uh, things uh, cross-sectional. And actually, the lifetime use of psychedelics is correlated to the in that sample to their openness scores. Um, um, and the we one of the reasons to look back in that sample was that we actually have measurements of the 2A receptor. We have PET imaging results in them. And, and therefore, we hope that maybe some of that could be sort of mediated through the level how the 2A receptor is regulated since these drugs really stimulate that receptor, but we couldn't find it. But it's also, you know, yeah, there's a lot of things that could, could, could play into to why that might not be, 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 be there in that sample, but, but it was not. Um, then I'm going to, uh, again, this is incredibly preliminary and I'm just going to show you very, very early results. And this might change because we might sophisticate the way we uh, analyze the data. But um, this is from the big online psychedelic survey. So in January, when, when I uh, uh, talked in this society, when they st were just started in earlier this year, I basically uh, thought this is going to be a promotion um, talk for this uh, website that uh, Mental uh, and Eline, who's not with, uh, she's back in London, a PhD student, and Robin mainly created this uh, this global online survey. And in the beginning, they were like, they came in to me and said, there's a lot of Danes um, uh, signing up for it. How can that be? So how many people do you have in Denmark? And it was like, it worked. I was like, yes. So thank you to whoever sits out here who have filled out uh, any of this. There are around 700 people or something, I think, have signed up for it. Um, and just to say, unfortunately, we don't have the big 
very uh, lucky for you who have had to fill it out, but the, we only have a very, very brief measure of uh, personality, which is just 10 questions instead of 240. That gives quite a lot of limitations to, to, to the tool, but it's still very nicely correlated with the, with the big tool. So, um, and this is uh, going to be looked more in, in detail. It actually is being looked at in detail by two uh, master student public health, uh, Victoria and Liz, who are here. Um, today as well. So they are going to uh, do very sophisticated analysis um, on, on this data. But here we, we, we have, um, again, extroversion, openness, agreeableness, and, blah, and these are the questions uh, whether people see themselves as extroverted. It's not that surprising, the questions related to the, to the, to the traits, um, but just two questions per, per trait. Um, and a very brief, brief, brief look at the data, so this, this, so people have to have filled it out both at baseline and at the four-week follow-up. A psychedelic, naturalistic experience could be in a retreat with their friends, whatever. All that information about details about the trip. We also have all that data. We haven't looked at it yet. We are starting to look at it, but this is just to see whether whether the personality actually seems to change in the data. And if you just look at it. Uh, raw what is in and we take the norm data from the paper that validated this measure tippy which is a 10 item personality inventory um, and the black box is is the norm norm data so uh, average of of healthy people that that uh, was put into the original validation paper of this tool and then from our online survey and you can see that the the red one is the baseline so people are scoring less on consensus, less on emotional stability, and less on extroversion, more on openness, and less on agreeableness, uh, as it looks on the figure, from, from when they enter, compared to the people who were the norm data material for, for validation of the tool. And, and then the, this one-off intervention, when assessed four weeks later, it pushes emotional stability up, so more emotional stable, four weeks after uh, compared to baseline, uh, borderline more extrovert, borderline more conscientious, and significantly more uh, agreeable. And, and openness is the one not changing. And that, that you might think, oh, hey, but psychedelics and openness. And, uh, but I think, I think that this week, first of all, we need to look into also people who are very experienced, people who are, are, are naive. That needs to be looked at in this data set. And another thing is, there might be quite a lot of people, obviously, they're already really high on openness. Some people might hit the ceiling. It's just two questions. We need to look, <laughs> who are so open already that they can't, they simply can't become more open on that scale. So either we need a better, the bigger scale, or we need to get rid of them, um, and not get rid of them, but get rid of the data and look at the people who are quite low on openness and see if they change, of course. So it has to be sophisticated. That is what Victoria and Liz are so lucky to be able to sit and play around with and, and look at because... Um, so, and in the depression trial, very, very briefly, we also measured personality. Um, so this is back at the 20 people or 19 because one uh, dropped out, but, but 19 people in the depression trial and they look a little bit different. This is again the black one is the norm data. This is the baseline, very, very high in neuroticism, not surprising. Remember, they suffered severe depression. Um, and um, low on concession, extroversion, and not too different on the two other ones. And then what happens? Um, this is three months uh, follow-up on personality. Neuroticism significantly down, extroversion goes up. So basically it moves towards the norm again a bit like in the survey, um, in the depression trial, move towards, now, apart from openness, here we go even more open. Um, and then these are the facets, so the, 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 the sub scores of each personality trait, they are listed here, they are 30 in total, as you also saw in, saw in the beginning, so six for each of the traits. And the one, the blue, are the ones that are significant early change, and they are also shown up here on, on, on the graph. And the ones that are most significant go that goes clockwise. So this one is the most one emotional, uh, positive emotions, warmth, blah blah blah, and this less significant over here. So there are a couple of openness values and actions that are very significantly changing here in the depression uh, sample. Um, and these are the questions we're not going to go into that. And then also um, 
very last couple of 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 uh, two last slides I, insightfulness which is one of the altered state of consciousness meshes that has to do with what you experienced at, during the session with psilocybin that the degree of insightfulness was associated with the changes so with the reduction in neuroticism that was seen in these depressed patients and with the increase in extroversion and spiritual experience was positively correlated with the increase in in extroversion um and uh, And then there were positive relationships, like they were borderline between extroversion and blissful state and also experience of unity. So there were some, some relations, again, back to the quality, the subjective effects of the experience and to the change that we are seeing. And um, then also, is baseline personality, that's a big question, is baseline predictive of how, what you experience? Um, is, is there more, some personality types uh, that are will be more prone to to have a peak experience than others um and um, there was a borderline significance between um, um uh, openness and blissful state um during the experience and i'll stop here and then i will This is basically a bit the same as Robin showed the all uh, overview of all the studies that have been done recently with clinical outcomes um so you can maybe get some of the slides somehow if you're interested afterwards and and this is the full it's not everybody who has been involved specifically in this it's it's robin's uh, collaborators basically everybody who's, who's <laughs> uh, uh, related to the psychedelic line of work in 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 the group at imperial um yeah thank you Thank you very, very much, David. Uh, should we take a, a few questions? Yeah. We have time for maybe two or something like that. Somebody has a short, precise, and nice question for uh, David. There's two people up there. Um, yeah, so the, what, what Martin said was that the, there's, of course, the chicken and egg thing. So if you do cross-sectional, as, for instance, the Copenhagen data, uh, we have people who we have done a lot of imaging on, and we also assess their personality. But we did it as a one-off thing. So the people in that group who are psychedelic users, if they're high on openness, is that because they were high on openness and therefore they started using psychedelics because they were so open to new experiences that they also tried that? Um, or is it the other way around that the psychedelic, maybe the, since there was this correlation between the more, the more times they've used psychedelics, the more open, the higher the score on openness, is that because every time they take a psychedelic they become slightly a bit more open? Or is it because they are so incredibly open from the beginning that the ones who are most open, they take most psychedelic? We can't know in a cross-sectional... It could also be a third, which I actually believe more. The reason why that correlation might be there that the, the peak experience, because people who have used it a lot probably have had a few more peak experiences, so, so those might be the one driving the, the change to openness, but we don't know. But um, because Catherine McLean and also now us in the depression trial at Imperial and McLean at Johns Hopkins, there you have people who are psychedelic naive who change in openness before and after. That's why I said it's strong when you have something before an intervention and after an intervention. If you see a change there, then you have sort of the causality more clear. Um, so there seems to be a causal link between use of psychedelics and, and increase in openness. But as you also can see in the psychedelic survey, people probably are very, very open. If we could, we, that I didn't show because that would be again up to Victoria and Liz to look at, are they scoring much more than the norm of open from the beginning? That's already an interesting question that we can answer from, the, from that survey. Um, yeah. Free mushrooms for racists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, David is also going to be in the panel later today, so I think uh, considering the uh, clock, maybe we should uh, wrap it up for now.